Okay. Uh, my name is Stephen Seiler. I am an administrator with Service Alternatives uh, based in Washington. I'm in the Training Institute, and uh, what I do is help agencies across the country with their behavioral and aggression problems. I am formerly a special education teacher, a community-based wraparound case manager, and all-around uh, problem solver. In my other life, I'm also a uh, photographer. So um, what we are here for today is to see if we can de-escalate anyone, anywhere, anytime. Actually, quick show of hands. How many people think that it's actually possible to de-escalate anyone, anywhere, anytime? Mm. <laughs> a couple strong hands, a lot of... Eh, I don't know. And how many people think, what are you talking about that is not possible? There's a few doubters. Okay. So give me an hour, or how long do we have? What's that? Hour and 15. Okay. And remind me to ask you at the end and see if we can uh, do that. Uh, specific goals are to help you learn how to remain in control at all times, support anyone, anywhere with any issue, and avoid the wrong response. You don't want the wrong response because the wrong response can make things worse. The information I will present to you today is distilled from uh, research. Uh, we've been doing research in these areas since 1993. And uh, professional experiences uh, going in and actually helping uh, schools, group homes, juvenile detention facilities, preschools, adult assisted living facilities with behavioral and aggression challenges. And a lot of that is uh, to demonstrate the success where they have statistics and so forth. This information is universal. It applies to any age person, any level of ability or disability, any kind of setting. So that's the strength in what we're going to share today. Uh, and one of the reasons why you will be able to de-escalate anyone, anywhere, anytime, because of these universal principles. I'd like for you to take a few moments to think about the last... <coughs> actually, sorry, I wanted to ask one more show of hands. Uh, how many here would say you have a lot of experience with de-escalation, de-escalating people, intervening? Successful. <laughs> Good or bad? Just do it a lot. A few people, and uh, how many would say you're just you're beginners, or uh, I don't know anything, and I want to learn? And okay, so mixed group. That's good. We'll uh, we'll benefit from some experience. I'd like you to think about the last incident that you were involved with. <laughs> Think about how that went. What happened? What led up to that? What caused it? What was your response? Did you respond? Should you have responded? Should you have not have responded? And how did it turn out? The reason I'm asking you to think about this is that you, when you apply strategies to past incidents, when you think about how it went and how I might do it differently next time, how I might apply what I'm hearing and learning to what I might do in the future, you will learn more from the information that you hear. Anyone have an incident they'd like to uh, share with us? Okay, for instance, yes, please. Okay. So we have an EBD room in EBC in our school. 
Okay. Elementary. Elementary school. Elementary and Behavioral challenges. Mm -hmm. And this little, little boy, Will, but he has got very, very, very strong language. So what's his age? He's fourth grade. So fourth grade. Nine grade. So nine. Yeah. And strong language. Strong language and runs. So he, would, he, he, got he runs, but I'm assuming it's not on the playground. It's no, it's the, the, the two places he shouldn't be going. He can get out the door because he's in a restricted area. No, restricted okay. Area. He gets out the door, and his aide was behind him, and they came running into the office, and he was taking his book and slamming it all over the place. And so I don't know what triggered it and what was going on. I just came out of my office because I happen to have an office in mm -hmm. that area. And I worked with this little guy before, so I don't know if I should have stepped in. You know, that might have been my first mistake. I don't know. You know so I you could, came along, and came he out. was banging his book Just in this office. You don't know what was yeah. going on, how it started. And his aide was sort of standing there, and, you know, and she was standing back. We have parents all around. So there were already people yeah. involved. Right. And I don't know if I was interfering with her or not. But anyway, I came out and I just went up to him and I said, so I'm saying that you're seeing very, very angry. And I, you know, why don't you, you want to come in and talk to me about it? You know, and so you offered to him to talk. How did he receive that? Well, he kept, he didn't try to rip the book anymore. He just kept slamming it up against the wall. And he wasn't, he likes to use his language. And he shut that off. And so I just kind of stayed there, and then he took off. <laughs> and so, so he did. He ran out. So, of the do you think he heard you when you offered to, I'm not, to I'm talk? Not sure. And that's why I was, you know, mm -hmm. that's why I thought, did I come into this at the wrong time? You know, because I know when they're all, you know, they're not there. Do they they're not you? there. Yeah. They're not hearing everything. They're not. They're hearing not. So, but he did. I just said really quietly you know, his name. Yes. Right? Did I just, you know, he seemed really angry tonight because it was right around the corner. And he was mumbling something that I couldn't hear what it was. Okay. <laughs> he was couldn't hear what he was saying. Yeah, but he was he was saying something. He was saying he, he he agreed that he was angry. That's all that I got out of him. Okay. And then he, <coughs> and then he took off. He, he took off back to his room, which back is really room. where they wanted to get him back to and he wouldn't come with them. But obviously they're not gonna talk to me. <laughs> so. Okay. But, and I'm not sure if I was okay. in the right spot. And just uh, for the sake of discussion, code name, his name is? George. George, okay. <laughs> Can, did everyone in the back hear the story? I was trying to paraphrase as much as possible. Okay, Louise, thank you for sharing that. And you brought up a lot of uh, interesting topics uh, related to de-escalation intervention, and we'll actually <coughs> refer to that if you don't mind, throughout the presentation, because you bring up a lot of the issues that we need to consider. Uh, and, the, and the first is, you said, he just, we, I know he wasn't there. I don't know, you know, so let's talk about what, that wasn't, what isn't there, what that means. Um, inside your head, you have several brains. <laughs> I know that sounds weird, but you have specialized functions in your brains, uh, one controls the autonomic feature, you know, like so you don't have to forget to breathe. Uh, motor control, emotion, uh, cognition, thinking, rational thinking about things. And uh, this specialization is good, but sometimes the different parts of your brain can be at odds with each other. Now, have you ever had that experience where, let's say, uh, you're on the highway and somebody suddenly cuts you off? <laughs> And it scares you. And then you realize, I need to let go of the steering wheel. And you're peeling your fingers off, and your heart's racing. It, did you feel that tingling feeling in your arms? And your So what is that? Adrenaline. That panic. So that's a survival response. Uh, commonly known as fight or flight. And... Uh, your body has these survival mechanisms programmed into it for your safety. So if you had to, if you had to think, wait a second, somebody's cutting me off. Maybe I should uh, slow down or move out of the way. That would you wouldn't keep you safe, right? So the survival part of your brain kicks on. 
adrenaline got mentioned. Actually, there are some 1,400 chemical responses that get triggered in your body when you have what's called an alarm reaction. Alarm reaction is that survival response that kicks in. 1,400 chemical reactions, they all kick in like that. Turns your body into action hero mode. So you're all about action, and what it does is actually shuts off the, the thinking part of your brain. And then response. So that's good in a survival situation. Actually, um, we mentioned fight or flight. And there's actually a couple more components to it. People, when you have that alarm reaction, you first freeze. Um, a researcher studying this looked at, uh, do you remember the Olympics were in Atlanta in 1996? And a bomb went off, and there was surveillance video. And what they noticed is that when that bomb went off, everyone froze. What happens is you freeze to assess what's going on. It may last just mere moments, split seconds, maybe a few seconds. But what's going on, and then you react. You actually tend to flee before fight. So what's known as fight or flight should more accurately be known as flight or fight. Some people have what's called a fear response. And, and this is where they completely shut down. I don't know what to do. This is like playing possum, playing dead. I, I'm, completely, I, I'm completely at a loss for what to do, and they just shut down. So flight, fight, or fear. All of this happens very quickly in your head. So that's good in a survival situation, but let's say you're on the job and you're helping somebody and you get threatened. That doesn't help you respond professionally. How many work in a profession where you are prohibited from, say, hitting back? <laughs> I, as a youngster, I studied um, Taekwondo, and when I first entered the helping profession, I had to unlearn that instinct to hit back when I got hit, because it was prohibited. Doesn't make good therapy. So, uh, st stress your body in those responses gets stressed. There's physical stress and there's cognitive stress. So what is stress? Dr. Lazarus, who studied this, defines stress as your perception of your ability to cope. Your perception. So stuff you can deal with, is that stressful? Stuff you can't deal with, is that stressful? Yes. So people tend to place stress. This is the situation is stressful. She's stressful. This meeting is stressful. People tend to place stress on the thing that's happening. Stress is really the experience. And that experience has been trapped through what's called the stress cycle. So the way you are normally is called baseline. When you encounter a stressor, you have a stress response. If that is severe, you will have that alarm reaction. What happens after that alarm reaction? So how do you feel typically after you've been involved in something fairly stressful, traumatic, involved? Exhausted, tired, worn out. See, you've expended all this excess energy. You will have to recover from the loss of that energy before you return back to baseline. Very good. Stress, is it a good thing? 
Wait a second. Aren't people always complaining about stress? Isn't stress a bad thing? When can stress be a good thing? It's a motivator? Yes. Stress is actually that rub that makes things happen. Yes? And I see stress like energy. Energy. But it depends how, how which is the amount and how we can manage. How you can manage that energy, that stress. Very good point. Thank you. So when do you get the most amount of work done? When you're on deadline, right? <laughs> so some amount of stress can actually be productive. Some say that without stress, nothing would ever get done. Some amount of stress can be productive. After all, that was, that's what motivates you to respond. If you have no response in some situation, let's say with George, where uh, he was running down the hall and then banging things, and you had no stress about that, you probably would not be motivated to respond. Uh, that's known as apathy. Too much stress, and that becomes unproductive. So stress can actually be a good thing. It's how you manage it. So I want you to think about stress. But it's also an awareness. Isn't it? Awareness? I mean, you don't stress out about it unless you need to know it. Uh, so aware meaning you're actually thinking about it. Um, so can you have stress over situations that you aren't really thinking about? <laughs> what do people think? So you may or may not be aware of it. Um, there's a lot of things that nag us each day. The things that we are aware of, that we are present with, we can do something about. The things that we're not aware of that, that's in uh, what's known as a blind spot, we can't do anything about that. So speaking of thinking, how you think about situations can also impact your response. So I don't know if I can deal with this. I don't know what I'm going to do with you. How many times do we have to go through this? The way you think about situations can actually prevent you from dealing with them effectively. So if Louise was sitting in her office, sees George screaming down the hall and hears banging in the, uh, in the library and says, well, there goes George again. Do you think she would be motivated to solve that problem? This is hypothetical or personal judgment. <laughs> and if I thought that way, I'd probably think, oh, there goes George. Would you be motivated to do behavioral assessments or problem solving if you thought, well, that's just George. That's just what he does. You uh, uh, may often think of these things uh, as, you know, like, I tend, when I think of examples, just think of being at home, you know, with family, the child. Come up with a lot of those. Again, unless you're aware of them, we cannot address them. How would you feel if firefighters showed up at the fire and said, Oh my God, I don't know if I can deal with this. <laughs> Give you confidence, right? You'd be thinking, we're sunk now. So um, Kathy brought up earlier that there were, this morning she learned about people having preconceived notions. Or, I'm sorry, what were they known as? They called it their filters. 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 The way you see the world filters the way you think about it. These are also known as cognitive distortions. 
Why is it a distortion? What happens is when you get stressed, stress changes the way you think about things. So if you're already thinking, George, that's our problem, student, then when you get stressed, you may start thinking things like, George is just going to make me fill out more paperwork today. Or we'll never get out of here. Now we're going to have to have another meeting. Or will we ever get anywhere with him? So you have to be careful with those cognitive distortions. How does my thinking reflect my ability to manage the situation? Or uh, being dysfunctional. So if you are responding to some situation and you are experiencing stress, then you have that physical response that you have to quell, that you have to manage to keep the survival part of your brain from taking over and shutting down the thinking part of your brain and activating that emotional part of your brain, which distorts or amplifies those negative filters. <clears throat> so one of our goals for this presentation was to remain in control at all times. Well, it turns out that a big surprise here is that in order to manage situations, we have to manage ourselves first. You have to take care of yourself before you can take care of anyone else. <clears throat> when you go on the airplane and you take off after they show you how to put the seatbelt on, they say when the mask drops down, what do they say to do? Put yours on first before helping anyone else. Why? Yes, if you're not breathing, you cannot help anyone else. So you have to take care of yourself before you can take care of anyone else. So part of being able to respond to any situation means that you must be in control of yourself. You control a situation by controlling yourself. You have to be in control of yourself to deal with anybody else, to be effective in a situation. Questions or comments so far? I agree with that. Sometimes I've gotten fights with my kids is because I'm tired and I'm overstressed and we're in a got to go somewhere or do something and it all falls apart. <laughs> so when you're tired and overstressed and there's too much going on, that's when it's really easy to lose. Good. Thank you for sharing. Any other comments or questions? Let's talk about relationships. We all love relationships, right? Why are we laughing? It's like a minefield, isn't it? Well, relationships can be very, very useful in a situation. Louise told us how she knows George. You didn't know exactly what happened that precipitated that in incident. But you know him enough to know that this may be just as far as he goes. Or banging things is how he expresses his anxiousness. Doesn't mean he's going to start pummeling somebody. I hope it doesn't, doesn't it? Could. Could? Okay. So you, you are aware of that. So the more you know this person that you're supporting, that you're intervening with, then the better you'll be able to support them. Pretty obvious, right? Unless, of course, our stress makes us forget those things. But what happens if you do not know the person that you are intervening with? What happened is she really had never interacted with George before. <laughs> Your son? You lost? I suggest you still have a relationship with that person. How does that work? 
you've never interacted with this person, but you have a relationship with them. Well, look at look at your role. What do you do in your work or in your personal life that has you crossing paths with this person? Um, I'm I'm guessing you're a counselor in a school. Okay. Well, counselors have a certain role in the school. She doesn't work directly with every student, but she still has an obligation to keep every student safe. She has to follow all the rules that apply to classroom teachers and everyone else. Um, you may encounter something in public. I, uh, I was at my local bank branch depositing a check when, um, it's a long story, but uh, I put something back at the seating area and I came back and the woman behind me thought I was leaving, took my place in line. So I just stood back there because I figured it was obvious everyone saw me standing in line for 15 minutes while they all came in. And then she started rumbling behind me and saying, I wanted, did I want to punch in the nose? <laughs> And I thought, whoa, you know, maybe I should have said something, but that doesn't warrant a punch in the nose. I could have punched her back. Because I'm just Joe Citizen in the bank, right? Well, there's also some rules of society that I followed, and I didn't punch her. She didn't actually hit me, so there was no cause for self-defense. But your role, your, if you do not know this person, you've never met them before, mm -hmm. there was some incident on the roadside, on the way home, and you pulled over and you got out. You know, there's probably some role there. You're at a store. You're at, at a, a, a library. Those things are going to guide how you interact with that person. <clears throat> what you will need to do is start developing a relationship so that you can help this person. That is, of course, if you are intervening and you haven't just walked off, but if you're still here at this point, it's because you probably want to help people. So to help us from getting lost, I'd like to tell you about a compass. Do you know what a compass is? This is a compass. Compass does one thing. Only one thing. Anybody know what that is? Points north. Points north. It's actually slightly complicated magnetic north. It's a magnet. It's a needle. All it does is points north. It doesn't tell you where to go. It doesn't know where you're going doesn't know where you are. The only thing it knows is where north is. <clears throat> so why is it so useful in traveling? Well, because it helps you with your orientation. It's a reference point. I just talked about relationships. What's your role? What are the rules that you have to follow? What are your civil responsibilities? What are your religious views? All of those things will point your de-escalation compass. Will point that needle in a direction that gives you that reference point. Does this make sense? Do you know which way your de-escalation de compass points? Do you know where that north is? If you've read all the policies and procedures where you work, and you know what you are allowed to do and what you are not allowed to do, then that points your needle. If you uh, have been around there for some time and have experience, this is generally how we do things, this is generally how we don't do things, that points your needle. What else points your needle? Your, your, own, your own personality. Your personality? How well you know yourself. Yes. How, how am I going to react? How am I going to react to this situation in general? Ah, very good. How, knowing yourself and how you will react. And once I got in, I mentioned earlier, 
ta uh, uh, Taekwondo, I realized that, hey, I might hit somebody without realizing it because my body was trained to do that. And I've got to reorient that. Yes? Mm, I see that the main thing is safety for everybody. Safety. Very important consideration. Safety for everybody. Everybody involved. For exposure to specific situations? So experience. experience yes, experience. Very good. So does that mean you're always going to do the same thing every time? That needle always points one direction. Does that mean it always points to like the one thing that you do? Why are you not doing the same thing every time? Every situation is different. You learn from your experiences. People are different. Very good. This brings us to our next surprise, our second surprise. One response does not fit all. One response does not fit all. <clears throat> and that's because people are different. Uh, every situation is different. You learn from experience. You got some new tools for your toolbox. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, crisis management training, and I'll hear people say this all the time. Well, I usually do blame, but this one time it didn't work. That's because you cannot expect the same thing to work on everybody every time. In fact, you take the same two people, the same issue on a different day, that may resolve differently. So individualizing responses are going to provide individual supports. So this person that we're dealing with and we're benefited by that relationship, they have their needs. George has George's specific needs. And we need to consider what his needs are if we're going to help George. It seems obvious to say this, but in real life, I think if you think about experiences, it doesn't always happen that way. You will do it my way. This is what I'm telling you to do. Or uh, I'll hear this quite frequently. Uh, you actually see this if you watch the TV show Cops. You see this if you watch every movie. They say, okay, you need to calm down, ma'am. Calm down now. <laughs> this morning I attended a different session and a woman shared the story with a young man in an elementary school with autism. And he had uh, a challenging situation escalated to the point where some, uh, some of the people in the building called the police. The police ended up coming. He ended up in handcuffs and leg restraints. And I think she said, who was there? She said 11 police officers? 15, 16 police officers? Okay, so here's the point of this. She then stated that um, his sock had fallen down. This is a young man with autism who's particularly sensitive to stimulus, physical stimulus. And he said, can you pull my sock up? He was very uncomfortable because his sock was down. May not seem like a big deal to most people, but to somebody with autism and sensory issues, that's very important. So she, as the, the teacher, asked the police, can, can we pull a sock up? No. Will you pull a sock up? No. Why not? I guess it was... They were in control. And so we'll do it my way. Sometimes the response 
to a situation can escalate the situation more than the original thing. So what we want to do is unplug the power struggle. You will get further in de-escalating people if you unplug the power struggle as opposed to plugging it in. And a lot of things we tend to do, plug it in. And I don't know why, but this term, calm down, just pisses people off. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You agree? I mean, it's just calm. Calm's not bad, right? Down? Is it down the directive? I'm telling you what to do? I, why, why do people react to that phrase? They don't know how to calm down. They would if they could. Sorry, didn't hear They don't think they need to calm down. They've been told to all our lives, so that's dismissive. And also what I feel, because you know what I find out, it's like the other person is not understanding what I'm feeling or thinking. Ah. So I said, no, why am I not? No, no. So, they are not understanding where I am. So I don't feel understood. And I said, I cannot, I cannot talk. That's what I think. I think that's a very good thought. When someone's saying calm down, that's coming from that person to them. That's a directive. We already talked about relationships and us, us understanding that person's needs and meeting that person's needs. So that doesn't reflect, I'm thinking about you and your needs. Mm -hmm. It's like they're dismissing. Dismissive. Yes. And telling that you are wrong. And saying you're wrong. Yeah. Yeah, it's a loaded term. I mean, there's a lot of baggage with that. <laughs> yeah, what I what I feel, I swear, when I hear calm down, no, no, I just respond automatically, no. <laughs> so, I don't know if you're By the way, you're saying no. Yeah. No is also something I suggest you avoid <laughs> in an escalation. Can you say no? with yes words <laughs> because the word no also plugs in that power struggle it's an invitation for a power struggle <clears throat> so uh i suggest you unplug that power struggle by using yes words how can you say no with yes words anyone think of an example as soon as you then you can have this back or then you can go do this <laughs> so you can do this or this these would be good choices instead of saying no that's not a good choice and you're handing over power by allowing them to make a decision hopefully they have uh, they're not too escalated to not be able to make that decision so it's like saying don't run you would say walk please so instead of don't run, say walk. Because mm -hmm. that's very important to think about. You know, if you only tell people what not to do, you still have yet to tell them what mm -hmm. to do. So no can be a shortcut for really explaining what's going on or what are the expectations. This person, so we've had a lot of examples here. This person who's escalated... Okay, so earlier we talked about when we get escalated, our brain scrambles, right? And goes into that survival action hero mode. Shuts off the thinking part of our brain. So those people that we're dealing with who are escalated, they are also reacting. If they're escalated, then they're reacting. They're not thinking clearly. Loss of rational thinking. Do uh, you remember the Charlie Brown, Brown cartoon? So what did I ever hear? When the teacher talked, what did you hear? <laughs> <laughs> so people may be, you got to keep it short and sweet. This is not time to talk about it. This is not, let's solve your problem now. This person's really escalated. So remember, we, went, we, we talked about that stress cycle. Thinking about that for yourself. You need to think about that for the people that you're dealing with. How escalated is that person? 
So Louise earlier was saying she told George, hey, if you'd like to talk about this, we can go to my office. Now, did I get this correct? He didn't seem to respond to that too much. So, but do we know if he didn't hear you, if he couldn't process that, or he heard it and processed it and just ignored you? We don't know. So look at the person's response as a barometer. If they if they are responding to you, if you say something and they say something back, okay, they're hearing you. If they demonstrate they heard what you said, then they're processing that. That will give you some indication of how escalated. Uh, while they're escalated, this is when you want to reach into your de-escalation toolbox, whatever tools you have uh, in your toolbox, use them. You may have been to various kinds of trainings, um, read books, all that stuff is good. You have to use the right tool for the right job. As we said before, one response does not fit all, so one tool is not going to, even on a Swiss Army knife that has every little witchamit thingy on it, you still have to pick the right one for the thing that you need to do. So anything that you learn can, can support that. Uh, so we were just talking about this assessing, assessing what's going on, assessing that person's response, their level of escalation. Are we getting somewhere? Is this helping? Is this making things worse? So if you're going to be assessing, what's the level of your thinking? Rational. So again, you have to remain in control of yourself in order to help that person do that assessment. Uh, let's talk about um, making it stop. So we talked about earlier, calm down, calm down now. Doesn't make it work, right? Does it? On TV it does. <laughs> In the movies it works, but that's not real life. In real life, watch what happens when you do those things. Where did so many two-year-olds learn to solve their problems by hitting? Did you teach your child that? Where did they learn that? Huh? Biting? Biting, yeah. yeah. We don't go around biting little kids. My, my daughter, before she was a year old, was pulling her mother's hair. Painfully. When she learned, when she could talk, the hair pulling stopped. Where does this violence come from? Is that something that they learn? I, uh, I studied anthropology in college and uh, behavior since then, and uh, I suggest that violence is a normal part of the human condition. Violence is normal. Solving your problems without violence, that's not normal. That's society. Society is artificial. It's an artificial construction. These rules that we have for each other, that will not take things from each other or hurt people. Or So before we had cities and all of that, how did the world work? But now, it's not like that. So this brings us to our third surprise. Making it stop doesn't necessarily make it stop. Huh? Making it stop doesn't make it stop.
See, you can make people stop doing things. Okay, the behaviorist should be cringing right now. Because you cannot make anybody do things. Well, you can make people do things, right? Against their will. But is that going to change things? I want to tell you about a young man who was in a group home. He was there because he hurt people. He, uh, he had autism. He would go up and he would slap people in the back. So hard it hurt. People called him a little monster. And he went to this group home. And the group home staff got pretty tired of getting slapped in the back. So what did they do? Punish him? Restrain him? Put him in timeout? Actually, they taught him the high five. Wait. They taught him the high five? Well, some staff thought maybe he's doing this as some form of social interaction, just doing it really badly. So what if we teach him a really good way to interact socially, and that's the high five? Taught him the high five. Guess what happened to the back slapping? Gone. They started doing that at the school. They started doing that at home. Guess what happened to the back slap? Gone. Why? They taught him a way to get his needs met. A way which was more positive, more productive, more socially acceptable. These are all the tenets of positive behaviors. Right? And those tenets are based on the fact that behavior is communication. It may not always be a good form of communication. <coughs> but it is a valid form of communication. What happens if they um, try to just make him stop slapping people in the back? Notice they didn't make him stop. They just taught him the high five. So what happens if they try to teach him, if they try to make him stop? He would just find something else to do. Actually, he probably would slap harder or try harder at first, may find something else to do. Be careful because what they find to do next, you may find worse than what they were doing in the first place. So making it stop isn't always the best thing to do. But yet what happens in crisis? People's instincts, I find from experience, are make it stop. Make it stop now, right? That's why you get to calm down. That's why you need to sit there. You need to do this. You need to do that. Because it's all about making it stop. And the more discomforting it is for the interveners, the more they want to make it stop. So uh, that's why positive behavior support is such a good idea. Yet, we just talked about how violence is a normal instinct and making it stop oftentimes leads to the interveners physically making it stop. There was a discussion this morning at another session about is physical intervention an emergency response or is it a behavioral intervention, a therapy? So we have to be careful about physical responses because the physical response can make the situation worse. It's a paradox. Physical response actually increases the likelihood someone will get hurt. <coughs> it's just physics. You get force against force, something has to get. A physical response may actually increase the likelihood of a physical response. It reinforces that undesired behavior. There's lots of studies on this. So if anyone wants citations, I'll be happy to give you two. 
the paradox of restraint is what we do to keep people safe actually often ends up in injury, abuse, um, can re-traumatize people. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Accidents. Accidents, yes. Uh, actually, there's uh, some studies out that show that the use of restraint as a response costs you more money. There's an economic cost to that. So a physical response should not be used for behavior management, should not be used for compliance, should not be used for punishment, should not be used to get your own frustrations out on this person. So when should you use a physical response? Well, actually, if it's going to make the situation safer. And this morning we heard stories about, well, <clears throat> the rule in my school district is we have a hands-off policy. Two students were fighting, and I knew if I did not get my hands between those two, someone was going to get hurt. And I would rather risk my job than to risk the safety of those two students because I did nothing to stop them. So sometimes when is the physical response the right response? It's when it's going to make the situation safer. So you've got to weigh out those risks. You've got to know what the regulations are, where you work, or where you live, and you have to have training. So we're talking about the back slapping. That's all about working smarter, not harder. This is the foundation of positive behavior support. But one of the things that that foundation is built on is long-term support. We begin to get blinders in crisis, and we just think here and now. This is happening now. I've got to make it stop now. I've got to do something now. But sometimes we also have to think about the later. And if we're in therapeutic roles, if this is our child, we have to think about that long-term picture of what is best in their, uh, their long-term interests. So in the short term, you're all about reaction and safety. In the long term, you're all about prevention. And helping people uh, build relationships and solve problems. There's a curious thing about prevention. Prevention means help make something not happen. So in your jobs, how do you know what to prevent? So you have a new student come into your district. You don't know what they're capable of. So it's kind of funny. You actually cannot prevent something before it happens. You can only prevent it after it happens. How do you know what to prevent unless it's happened? Right? Sorry, you're going to say? I was just saying that there's a few work. Sometimes there's good documentation and doesn't get all the teachers and all the good news how to respond to the way it works. Okay, so if there's records, if there's documentation, if there's plans in place that tell you, and that comes from here. Those records are that long term process. So there's a term for responding after something has happened to prevent it from happening, and that's called postvention. Have you heard of that term, postvention? So what you do after a situation to prevent it from happening again the next time. Postvention prevents problems. When you know something is an issue, then you know what to address in the long term. But sometimes we get the records, you know, one month, two months later, and the kid already did something. They remember a mom that was saying, yeah, my kid threw away this, kind of rest like, you know, like four teachers. 
but uh, we, we don't have the records now. <coughs> but what I do is, I when the students come, I check with every student and I introduce myself and I try to do a relation with them. Uh -huh. So then when it's a problem, they remember me and it's not, you know, I'm foreign people that just is showing up to like bond with them. Excellent. So it's try to make a relation before and I play with them and I have fun. So then So they, when you have those new students come in, you make a point of developing a relationship with them. There is more time, but long term it works. Yes, over the long term that yeah. works, that long term focus. Post suspension prevents problems. When you know something is an issue, then you need to work to prevent that from happening in the first place. Um, that also deepens those relationships. And we need to learn from experience. I say, I always say, the best problems are the ones you don't have in you. So if you have problems and you don't have any more because you've taken the time to work on those and prevent those. Prevention is the dominant paradigm in so many fields. It's not necessarily the most dominant paradigm in behavior management, but there's some very specific things we're all here today for positive behavior support. Proactive environment is another way of managing that, also known as therapeutic milieu. How you control the situation by controlling the environment proactively. A proactive environment is an environment that's tailored to meet the needs of individuals, designed for safety, and created to encourage effective learning opportunities. So let me ask you this, why do you have to come to a conference to learn about PBS, positive behavior support? Why isn't it just normal, like what we do, like how our schools run? What's that? We get busy and then we react. We, we get, get busy and we react. <clears throat> yes. So you need to practice yeah. and reinforce. Uh, positive behavior support takes work, yes? Time, money, will always go hand in hand. That's an investment. And it's actually harder to do than just reacting, responding to problems. So it's something out of the ordinary that people go to work to do. So leadership, empowering people, will result in transforming problems into success. Somewhere over here there was somebody said something about learning from mistakes, learning from failures. Um, and a failure is not necessarily a problem. A failure is an opportunity to learn. <clears throat> The concept of inside-out change. Anyone heard of inside-out change? Is our fifth surprise. Changing the way you think and respond in order to make a difference with the situations you're dealing with, reflects the inside out change. So like with PBS, you have to go out of your way to do it. But you do it because you know that's an investment in solving problems. De-escalating crisis, 
crisis intervention also requires inside out change because that's how we transform those problems into success. Comments or questions on uh, inside out change? I wouldn't expect that to be a big shock for those who are here. It's positive news for a conference. So I'm often asked uh, in this crisis situation, what do I do? Just tell me what to do. Well, we already know one response does not fit all. But I can give you three principles which apply to every situation. Three guiding principles for every situation. <clears throat> Meet the needs of the person that you are dealing with. Reflect respect and dignity in this interaction. And maintain safety, safety for all. You may not always know what to do in a situation, but Following these three guiding philosophies will help you in choosing the right response. So, I don't know what to do. I'm going to try this. Will it meet the person's needs? Check. Yes. Will it reflect respect? Yes. Will it be safer than what's happening now? Yes then it's probably the right response. If it doesn't meet all three of these, it may be the wrong response that might make the situation worse. 